Gary Christopher. Hey, congratulations for Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, the Robert England story. Thank you. We really, Thank you very much. Yeah, we're really proud of it. Really are. I know. I mean, this is such a long title. You guys could have come up with something shorter. <laughs> we did. We did. It we was actually called did Icon. have. It was called Icon originally. Yeah. And Robert you James did. that it was just a bit. Random was it? What did the producers say to us? No, it, it was Robert. It was Robert who changed it. Oh, it was Robert who changed it. Yeah, oh, blame yeah. Robert. Blame Robert. I think Robert's title was actually long. It was like Hollywood Dreams, Nightmares, the life and story of a Hollywood actor in horror films starring Robert England. <laughs> <laughs> Divas, man. Divas. Well, you know what? You're right. This this one is much better than. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a history of that in a way, haven't we? Leviathan, the story of Hellraiser and Hellbound, Hellraiser too. <laughs> well, gentlemen, tell tell us what spawned you guys to uh, make uh, this uh, documentary in the first place. Uh, like Chris just said, we we'd been working for ten years together. Myself, Chris, and Adam, our, our kind of co-director of our company, Corp Screenings and Dead Match Productions. And we did some documentaries on Leviathan, the story of Hellraiser. We did You Also Call Brewster, the story of Fright Night. And then we did um, Pennywise, the story of It. <laughs> and then the story of Story, Story, Story of. Uh, and then obviously we're working on Robo Dark and some other projects. But I've been a fan of Robert England since I was a kid. You know, I was allowed to watch horror films at the age of four and five years old. And Robert's always been there. You know, back in the mid 80s as a child, I had a poster of Robert England on my bedroom wall as Freddy Krueger. I had the T-shirts when I went on holiday. So I always wanted to do something with Robert. And I discussed this very closely with Chris about what could we do to involve Robert. And the problem we had was our friend Mikey Perez uh, had gone and done a documentary called Never Sleep Again, covering the whole of the franchise of Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, it's a 40-hour documentary, wherever it is. But it's an amazing documentary. And Robert features heavily in it, obviously, as Freddie. So what, you know, what could we do next? And then we discussed, obviously, as a, as, a, as a filmmaker, we wanted to develop more into a career focus. And straight away, it was Robert for us. It was 100%. You know, if we're going to do something, it has to be Robert. That's probably right, isn't it, Chris? That kind of journey, you know? Pretty much, yeah. I think for us, it was like, let's, let's just try something new. We loved, we loved making that. We still do love making documentaries on films, which historically have been called by, you know, some naysayers, the glorified bonus features. You're like, yeah. We put a bit more effort in than that. So to do something a bit more character-based, a narrative, a story of, well, like a, a true story, not just about a fictional piece of IP, um, was something I was like really keen on doing. You know, let's try something different. Um, so that's one of the things. And I think you, you broaden your horizon a bit by talking about someone's career because you're covering not just one film, you're covering a whole career's worth. And in this case, from the early 70s right through till now. So to kind of go on that journey, you know, through time um, was one of the things I was most looking forward to with this project. So how did you guys pitch this uh, to Robert and um, eventually uh, convince him? Convince him. I mean, he, your, your documentary shows him he's such a nice guy. So I, I, I wasn't even sure if he just says yes to everything. No, no. Robert, he's notoriously hard to get hold of. I mean, a lot of people try and get hold of Robert for interviews and for films. And, and he gets inundated with email requests. I've seen, you know, someone's doing a short film you know, for 50 quid and they want to get Robert in it. You know, they want to do an interview with him. So he's notoriously hard. But we were lucky with Mikey Prez. Mikey knew Nancy, Robert's wife, obviously from a documentary, Never Sleep Again, because obviously she, she, she basically is Robert's bodyguard, really. She's got the... She protects him, you know, from, you know, the outside world. And obviously she kind of calms him down and says, you know, you've got to, we've got to think things through. We've got to work through his requests properly. Because I think Robert would say yes to everything if he had the chance. So we, but I basically just did, you know, the, the cliche kind of long email. But actually from the heart, I sent him an email, which was basically why he wanted to do this. <laughs> why he wanted, my nice cat. Why he wanted to do this. Um and why, you know, why, why it meant so much to, to us as well, you know, being a fan, obviously, you know, being a fan of film, fan of Robert. And we, the next thing you know, I had an email back from Nancy saying, Robert would like to talk to you at 8 p.m. on Sunday. What, please send your number. So I did that. I mean, you know, 8 p.m. on the Sunday evening, the phone rings and it's Robert. And straight away, it wasn't like Robert the actor, Robert an ego, Robert, Freddie Krueger. It was just Robert, the man going, like we, like we knew each other. It was a really strange conversation. And straight away he said to us, um, you know, 
if you're going to do a documentary on Freddy Krueger, I have no issue you doing that, but I'll give you an interview. If you're going to do it on my career, I will give you everything. I will be fully involved, fully engaged. And that was kind of the pitch, really. We met him in London then, and then we kind of did a face-to-face pitch. And then it just snowballed then. And obviously, Chris came on board, and we got shooting it, didn't we, Chris? Yes, we did. <laughs> wow, that that's actually amazing. So where did you guys initially start i guess i guess nightmare on elm street was the easiest path right did you start with that or did you go all the way back to the beginning uh i think i mean regards to the story obviously freddie's really important to it and i think chris probably mentioned about the agency in a minute about we could we did concentrate on not Elm Street section quite heavily at one stage uh but yeah i mean it was really just trying to get for me it was the very start i knew he was classically trained i knew that and I, and I knew, obviously, from reading his biography, there was little bits about his family and his parents not obviously wanting him to be an actor. So it was really going right from the beginning, really, with Robert, about where did it all start? And obviously, then, as Chris will allude to, I'm sure, about the impact of Freddie on that career, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah, I mean, like, as uh, Gary said, uh, so Robert had said to Gary something along the lines of, you know, if you want me to talk about Freddie, I'll talk about Freddie. That's fine. But if you want to talk about my career as a whole and the other films I've been in, you know, I will give you my all. You have all of me. So there's that inevitable thing of like chronicling someone's career from beginning to end or to to now. Sorry, because he's still going. But um, for me, one of the challenges I enjoyed the most was having watched these documentaries on Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, on the Blu-rays and the feature length doc so many times. The challenge I enjoyed the most was it's inevitable Freddie's going to be in there. There's that crass element that's a selling point. It's certainly prominent in the trailer. But Robert's happy with that, I believe. And that so for me, what I enjoyed the most in terms of covering the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise is we don't need to do a deep dive on it. We don't need to know all the ins and outs and all the other personnel. Let's talk about it from Robert's perspective. So it's about a 20-minute segment in the middle where it's a bit like, I keep using this now analogy, but what I love the most structurally is it's a bit like, you know, a gangster film like Scarface. You're watching this journey on the way of someone going up, 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 up. They hit that plateau, and then here it is, that big montage. And so that's kind of how we treated Nightmare on Elm Street. But, of course, then we, we wanted to make sure we tackled how then it became a bit more sporadic throughout his career. And then that's where he sort of started to have, like, elements of, I don't know if I want to keep doing this you know i'm not sure it's kind of pigeonholed me but freddie will always be there and so what i kind of quite enjoyed was being able to dive because there's no there's no massive drama in robert's life per se like some other people's stories have been you know accidents or something you know life-threatening so the dichotomy we wanted to work with and sort of focus on just to give it a bit of a narrative lift was okay this is the biggest thing you've got, but you've done all this other stuff. But how does that make you feel? It's a bit cathartic on his part, probably to talk about, yes, it's been great. And I love it for this reason. And I've embraced it and dealt with it. However, at times it has caused me a little bit of, you know, maybe anxiety and resentment from missing out on other opportunities. So that's what I enjoy the most. I think that's what we tried to do with Nightmare on Elm Street primarily. I know I, I was watching your documentary and I had no idea about all these different films and then i'm like thinking going wait a minute that was him yeah yeah that's <laughs> that was that was the intention i think we want people to watch the doc and go one oh was actually that him in stay hungry was that him in so-and-so film but then go back and watch those films as well and i think that's what robert wanted robert wanted people to go let's go and watch that you know because it means a lot to robert i think and, and i think if you're a fan of robert and you like you watch his documentary go out and buy these films, rent them, and obviously, you know, just enjoy Robert's performance of a non-Freddy Krueger kind of character. You know, this, the sidekick, the Joker, the kind of, like, comedy. Because he's a brilliant comedian, and you can tell that. And he's, and he's, he's a raconteur, he's a storyteller, and there's comic timing in his stories, perfect comic timing. And we've managed to capture some of that, I believe, I hope, in the doc. You know, some of his little nods to the camera and his little kind of, like, quirks. So... It's it's amazing. Like there there's so much information with uh, Robert, especially with the old footages, his uh, his career, and so on. This could have easily been a series. Yeah, 
I think you know, we, the we, Mr. Arnold Schwarzenegger's run today is a three-part yeah. series. I'm like, oh, damn it, why didn't we do that? But I think it could have been. I think we've got, we had so much footage of him, and it's really hard for us as filmmakers because our previous documentary on Hellraiser was seven hours long, and we kind of... We, we kind of got some kind of like negative stuff on that, but lots of positive stuff. People love the length of it. But as we've moved on in our, on our, our film careers, we've been told a little bit by people, make it shorter, make it tighter. We, but we like long documentary. We, we do like them. Um, but I think with this one, it just felt kind of right that it was kind of like these two hours, just over two. I mean, we would have liked to be a lot longer. We had, we had nine hours of footage of Robert. I mean, there's literally nine hours of him talking. Uh, sometimes the same stories, uh, but it's you know, so there's, there's plenty there. But it's how much you get around those stories, and what you don't want then, obviously, is just Robert for nine hours talking, then you know, or three part series. So, I, I think maybe if we were doing it now, uh, we probably would have considered a series. I think now, because obviously, you know, we've just done obviously Robo Doc as a four part series. Obviously, this documentary, as Chris mentioned, about Arnold Watching is coming out as a three parter. And people seem to like these binge series now. So, you know, in the future, there might be something, you know, on, a, on another project where we do a series kind of biography, I think, maybe. Robert can pop up in it somewhat. <laughs> so, sometimes it's quite fun, though, in terms of the challenge of... Yeah. It's a bit like... I always use the analogy. It's a bit like a tweet. How can I say a piece... Especially in the old school Twitter days, before you had to pay for your blue tick and gone as well. But, the, you know, there was always that challenge when writing a tweet where you're like... Oh, I want to say this, but oh no, I've got to backtrack, and now I'll change the and to a symbol and. Yeah. I quite like that challenge in a way of making something lean and mean. You know, just keep the pace going, keep the momentum up. So we could have probably expanded it, but I, I don't think we've necessarily lost anything overly integral from any other anecdotes. You know, if anything, the original cut was two hours fifteen and finished and had less content and we actually got the opportunity to re-edit it after its first screening and actually fit more content in and shave off five minutes so like the halloween anecdote wasn't there before oh, montage, the, yeah. the film wasn't there before uh, a bit about the 90s montage and the 2000s montage they didn't exist before so that's what i kind of enjoy it's like oh my god we can still do it but just make it quicker snappy and a bit flashier as well just in case you get a bit lethargic listening to a film you might not be interested in. Actually, we've now kind of gone, right, let's trim that. So on to the next one, on to the next one. It doesn't give you that opportunity to kind of go, oh, I'm getting bored of this one, which I think the original cut kind of did in places, didn't it? Well, most excellent. So as audiences have a chance to watch your uh, documentary, what do you hope that they would walk away with after watching this film? I think it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of the core basics of this is a man who is a horror icon but there's a lot more to robert there's a lot more this is the reason why you love freddie so much i mean eli roth says this i think in the doc the reason why you love freddie is because you love robert and i don't think people realize that and i think it's something really nice what eli says about the academy awards i think it's in one of the bonus features actually this is it is in the bonus feature which you probably haven't watched and i think he says you know people think of these actors who are Academy Award winners, Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, everybody knows Robert England. And I think we want people, like you just said at the very beginning of this interview, we want people to go, shit, that was him in that. Oh, that was him in that. And then go back and watch his films and appreciate Robert for more than just Freddy Krueger. This is a guy who's been in the business for over 40 years. And I think he's got a lot more to give. I think he's got a lot more, you know, hopefully he'll have a renaissance in his career even at the age he's now, I mean, it happened to Brian Cox recently with, with Succession. It can happen to these actors. They can have renaissance. Christopher Lee did. He had a massive renaissance, obviously, in the you know the, the later cool. stage of his career. So, um, yeah, we hope that happens. We hope people revisit his films and want more and demand more of Robert performances. I agree with Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the one the one thing I definitely picked up on, yeah, you know, um, it's the trivia. I think we kind of uh, managed to knock out, uh, not us personally, but this story manages to knock out the park. Like, oh my god, he worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger back then. He worked with James Cameron on another film, and yeah, you know, get a chance to reevaluate. I think reevaluate his work. I think you know, it's the stigma of oh yeah, just the, the Freddy Krueger guy. You know, watch this, and hopefully that will sort of shift perceptions a bit to be like, shit, man, this guy needs to be. And yeah, like Gary says, you know, have that kind of what there's just something. I mean, it's one of the questions I think we did ask, we never utilized really is what do people want to see next 
of Robert. You know, what is that next phase to go through? He says himself, he's gone from the protagonist to the old scientist and all this and that, but I feel there's just, so, there's something there. Something there, Maybe yeah. We something should waiting. Something there. Yeah, there's <laughs> something definitely there, you know. I think there's something that someone needs to pick up on. I think a director out there needs to grab him in something. Stick him in a Marvel film, you know what I mean? Stick him in something you don't expect to see him in. And I think he'll just, he'll just, he'll just flourish in those films. I think he will. He's got it still. Even that one scene in Stranger Things, he still was that episode and that one scene he's in. Give him more in next season. You know, let him face off against Vecna. You know, you know something he needs more. And I think that's going to happen with, with his career. Most because of this. <laughs> <laughs> Most excellent. Well, um, let me remark uh, one more thing because, Gary, I keep on staring at your background with all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. You, you, you put... Do you always have that stuff? Uh, or <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is, this is my office. It's a bit of a, a bit of a dive at the moment. I've got it's full of like crap. The Pennywise there, and then obviously there's a Michael Myers. The there. There. <laughs> yeah, so it, it literally it's just it's where I dump all my crap as well as everywhere else in in the house really. So it's kind of these wall hangers are pretty new. I make I kind of make special effects stuff as well myself um, as a little kind of like. But uh, post COVID, kind of like you know, during COVID, I needed a hobby, and that was making this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's um, it's always there. I've always been a hut collector. I think Chris is the same. Chris's man cave is full of crap, like my house. I, just, I buy <laughs> stuff. I don't make stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I make the films, but I just yeah. buy shit. <laughs> it's easier. Then, 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 then let me let me part with uh, one last question because the only odd thing in that room is is that are those presidential action figures in that glass case? Well, really naughty. Probably today's hashtag Me Too. That's actually Kevin Spacey from um, House of Cards. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Frank Underwood. So let's yeah, let's not mention Kevin Spacey's career and where it's gone to. But uh, you, I love that show, and they made an action figure of Frank Under Underwood. So. Yeah, that's that's the hashtag. Dick Jones from Robocop as well. Yeah, Dick we Jones go. there as well, and we've got Negan and Robocop. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the hashtag me too closet. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day there'll be a statue of Chris in there as well, probably. Oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I enjoyed this conversation and thank, uh, thank, thank you, you. Uh, for talking to us about Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, the Robert England story, and um visiting your office crib. <laughs> appreciate thank it you. thank you thanks appreciate very much you. mate thank you